The comments, opinions, and views shared during this program are of those individual Freemasons and do not reflect the official position of a Grand Lodge, Concordant Body, Appendant Body, Masonic Authority, or CraftsmanOnline.com. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. Hello again, it's Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com. You've joined us for an episode on Masonic ritual and modern science as we bring back to the podcast, first time, long time, Brother Angel Millar. Welcome back, Brother Angel. Oh, thank you very much. It's nice to be speaking with you again. I know, I've missed you. <laughs> we <laughs> almost you. let you slip by a whole season without <laughs> joining us. Uh-huh. And he's been a, bit, uh, a very busy brother since becoming the editor-in-chief of the Fraternal Review almost two years ago. And he joins us this month to talk about the October issue of the Fraternal Review magazine, which connects with a previous in- uh, issue that you dedicated to fringe Freemasonry. So... Before we get into this month's issue, what do we need to recall or maybe review from the Fringe Masonry episode or issue so that we can better understand things? Sure. So that was really an introduction to some of the rites of Fringe Masonry, such as the the Egyptian rite of Masonry and the Asiatic Brethren, the latter of which was sort of teaching Kabbalah during the 18th century. And there were other such rites as well, the strict observance, which claimed to descend from the Knights Templar. Uh, it, it, it didn't descend from the Knights Templar, but that was its claim. And there were, you know, other slightly further afield orders, such as the Golden Rosy Cross, that was made up entirely of Freemasons, but there was teaching alchemy and claimed to have a ghost-raising machine and this kind of thing. So that issue really looked at the sort of foundation of fringe masonry, particularly among these sort of uh, interesting and often forgotten uh, 18th century Masonic or fringe Masonic rites. I feel very fortunate. I'm sure brothers who are uh, subscribers of the Fraternal Review or just fans of the Esoteric are like, wow, he's got the editor-in-chief Angel Malar on, and we've kind of timed the release of this episode to go with the release of the current issue. Before we really dive into some of the deeper meanings and the writings, I want to talk a little bit about the authors that you have that are contributing in this October issue. You've got heavy hitters from Jamie Paul Lamb, Piers Vaughn, John Mangiovi, Richard Kaczynski, and Frater UD. Tell us a little bit how you pulled these writers together. Yeah, so yeah, I wanted to look more at the uh, the actual practices of uh, fringe masonry, especially as they touch on quote unquote magic. And um, you know, so it was a, in the last or the first issue, as they say, we looked at some of the sort of foundational rights. And uh, you know, here I decided to look more at the practical, which which in a way, it gets neglected. For example, with Frada UD, we look at the use of the grips in quote-unquote old Turkish Freemasonry, but uh, it's they were really used in sort of energy practices. So you would use the Masonic grip in a certain way, and in your hands, you would feel this energy, uh, which is really, like if, uh, if people are uh, intimate with Chinese martial arts or Japanese martial arts, they would know of qi or ki, this sort of inner energy that can be cultivated and used for health or healing and this kind of thing, and and so you find this in in the, in this fringe Masonic um, writing and fringe Masonic uh, practice of of the grips, and uh, you know with with uh, John Mon Jovi uh, that I interviewed was a, f- a friend of mine and he taught me uh, uh, hypnotism. But uh, he's a board-certified hypnotist, Freemason, a natural uh, practitioner of uh, mesmerism, or more accurately, uh, magnetism, uh, a practice which had descended from uh, Franz Anton Mesmer, an 18th century sort of healer and hypnotist uh, active in France. And, uh, and so, you know, we talk about uh, the overlap between hypnotism and Freemasonry. And, and in my article as well, I discuss uh, how hypnotism and Freemasonry actually merged in the 18th century uh, in certain rites as well. I, and I uh, claim, and I think I'm right about this, that really the modern magic 
is in essence a fusion of fringe Masonic ritual and trance. And you find this in Freemasonry during the 18th century, especially in France. Uh, and in my mind, I was highlighting some of the keywords because you've devoted so much of your thought and insight on the subject of magic. And that's definitely going to be prominent in this October issue, but also hypnotism and mm -hmm. energy. And one of the quotes that you state in the uh, editor's word is, quote, magic is undoubtedly older than religion, end quote. Mm. So you and I have talked about this, the term modern science. What does that mean to you? And how is it different than maybe ancient or early magic? Yeah, well, magic has changed throughout the millennia, for sure. So, you know, if we look at uh, shamanism, as, as far as we can you know, know and can tell, uh, from remnants of it and from whatever myths may represent that, uh, you know, it, it, it's very different to say medieval Kabbalistic magic, where which was very scholastic and would be talking about mathematics and angels and geometry and all sorts of things. So in there, uh, during the medieval period, natural magic was considered and Kabbalistic magic was you know considered to be uh, to some degree uh, acceptable because natural magic drew on natural law which had been created by god so it wasn't you know so you could heal somebody with you know let's say garlic or you could do some kind of natural magic but it was still working with the forces that god had created and within its limits uh, and, you know, Kabbalistic magic or the Kabbalah, of course, uh, related to you know, the he Hebrew, the Bible, and, and to Christian theology as well. You know, later on in the modern era, again, you know, it's really today, it's hugely infused with the thought of uh, uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Uh, you know, if you listen to practitioners, they will often say that, well, you know, I'm, they are praying to these gods or goddesses, but uh, these are really just archetypes uh, in the imagination. So they really have a sort of psychological uh, practice, not not one that would really be recognized uh, philosophically anyway uh, by any magician prior to the modern age or prior to the creation of uh, psychiatry and psychology. But uh, getting to your your comment about science, um, so yeah, modern science is interesting in relation to the esoteric because, um, on the one hand, and a lot of uh, Freemasons and esoteric practitioners don't really want to hear this, but uh, you know why was Freemasonry so huge during the 18th century? And often the answer that you get is, well, we're shaking off the you know the dogma of of the the church, and it was this. And there was this organization for all religions and this kind of thing. Well, that's fundamentally untrue for a start. I mean, there were there were a number of Jews initiated early on. Uh, certainly in Europe, uh, you didn't get much of that. It was mostly Christians and certainly Freemasonry well, well into the 20th century in, in Germany only initiated Christians. Uh, there was no interest in initiating uh, other religions, uh, not least of all because uh, apart from a you know, a tiny minority of Jewish people. There really were no other religions in, uh, you know, north northwestern Europe at all. I mean, you didn't find uh, Muslims and Hindus living in Great Britain or France or or Germany or the Netherlands during the 18th or even the 19th century. So there was no interest in making this some kind of universal religion. That's totally ridiculous. Uh, you know, the religion Freemasonry became enormously important because during the, or partly because during the 18th century, you had attacks on the church and attacks on Christianity. And, and Freemasonry, in a sense, was a, res a response to this secularization of society and this idea that you know, everything can be discovered through reason and the and mystery and rituals are just superstitious nonsense. And we need to get rid of all that. And, and we'll just have reason. And through our rational faculty, we'll discover the truth of everything and create a utopia. And while, while that's the claim of the philosophers and the cult of enlightenment, 
uh, Freemasonry is saying, no, we've got even more secrets and we've got even more rituals and we're not going to tell you the secrets and we, we guard these secrets which are even more complicated than the church. Although almost all of the time they had a, a Christian message. Uh, you know, people think that, you, you know, the Knights Templar uh, were guarding some sort of anti-Christian uh, ideals. Well, that certainly wasn't what the strict observance thought or what all of these knightly rites of, of uh, Freemasonry thought. It was all intertwined with the Christian mystery uh, because 99% or well, the vast, vast majority of people, apart from, you know, a few intellectuals, were in some way or another Christians, uh, just as in the Middle East today, the vast majority are Muslims. Uh, I love having guests like you because I often wonder, like, I know your camera, you can see my face, but I'm like, does he have a camera where he can see the notes that I'm jotting down? <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to ask you if, if it's fair to say magic is really what we would consider science today. Yeah. And if magic is science, then really what that is, is man's attempt to define or explore faith and religion and why Freemasonry would be involved in this equation is, as you said, on one hand, Freemasonry, a lot of our stories come or allegories come from the historical text of a volume of sacred law, yeah. a Bible, whatever religious book is there, just as a basis of saying this happened at this time, or here's the values and moralities that all good men can agree on. But then on the other hand, we also talk about the seven liberal arts and sciences and where during that time in the world would you have had a gathering or group of truth seekers or just like minded men who are learning about arithmetic, logic, geometry, um, all of all of those liberal arts that would have only been reserved to people at a certain class that were able to get that education. Yeah, well, certainly, uh, you know, most people were not very educated during the 18th century. But if you were educated, you would have known the seven liberal arts. And, and uh, you know, even, you know, people uh, today say they have a, a Bachelor of Arts. Well, the, the Bachelor of Arts comes mm. from the seven liberal arts. And while you didn't tackle this in the issue, I was. I also had another note not a, jotted down here. I'm curious if, in this modern science now, how technology and innovation that would definitely be considered magic. I imagine, and the role of AI or machine learning, and how our ancient brethren who were the original magicians, magnetists, hypnotists, what they would have thought of this progression where we are now in modern times? Yeah, well, I'm not sure what they would have thought, but certainly if, if you go back to some point in history, whatever it may be, whether it's a century ago or 2,000, 3,000 years ago, then yeah, certainly AI would have been thought of as magic because they had no conception of science at a certain point. But I, I think if it is magic, then it might turn out to be black magic. So we shouldn't necessarily get too excited about it or think that we're allied to it. So, and, um, you know, and, and, and at the end of the day, whether the magic is good or not, um, it is trying to work with sort of uh, supernatural forces, uh, which in some way relate to the divine or possibly its, its adversary. What AI might be doing, I'm not sure. Maybe it will open up all kind of vistas for creativity, but it it will also open up all sorts of problems uh, for such as spreading propaganda and 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 actually removing us from the sacred even more by making us think that well even human intelligence is subordinate and and less less uh, less interesting than artificial intelligence yeah. i'm going to try really hard to make an analogy that will get a smile from you maybe even a laugh but it it's got to be like I'm, I'm thinking of one of your favorite scientists, Newton, if, you know, sitting under the tree gets hit with apple, he, an apple falls on his head, he discovers gravity. Imagine the reaction if you put, you know, VR goggles on him and he's looking at virtual reality. It had to be like your parents the first time they heard Beatles music with this overproduced, amazing sound and just how it must have yeah. completely flipped their mind. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> that was the goal. The goal was to get a, a smile.
Hey, it's Brother Michael Arce. Just want to take a couple seconds to talk about our Patreon subscription offer. For just $5 a month, you can get early access to these episodes and ad-free. That means no me telling you about the Patreon subscription or those annoying commercials before and after our podcast. Get subscriber extra episodes. Like, for example, did you know that Angel Malar was a Buddhist monk? I'm going to let that sink in for a second there. Angel and I are going to be talking extensively about that experience in our bonus time. The Subscriber Extra episodes drop on Wednesday, and it's our way of just thanking you for pledging that $5 a month. Where does the money go? It goes to the working group team here at Craftsman Online. All the production costs associated with producing the Craftsman Online podcast. So take a test drive. We give you a free seven-day trial of the Patreon membership. You can listen to the subscriber. Subscriber Extra episode with Angel that'll be dropping on Wednesday of this week. Plus, check out some of the back episodes that you might have missed the bonus content for. And thank you in advance for supporting the show. Now, let's get back to this episode. I want to get back to your article and one of the points that you made on fringe masonry, hypnotism, and the making of modern magic. And we've talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to kind of dive into this is the the practice of magnetism. This was completely new to me. Yeah. And reading about this, hypnotism is also a big part of this. Yeah. How was it practiced in the East versus in the West? And what kind of led to one style of hypnotism becoming the dominant practice? Yeah. So hypnotism really is a Western practice. Um, obviously, you could debate when it begins. But, uh, for example, the National Guild of Hypnotists in America suggests that the, the first practice of hypnotism, so far as we know, uh, was in uh, ancient Greece, uh, in the temples of Asclepius, and in the ancient uh, Egyptian temples, or sleep temples as well, uh, which were used for healing. Uh, and that may be true, we don't exactly know what they were doing, but it seems like there might be some sort of uh, hypnotic uh, practice in there. They were involved with uh, dreams, for example, as well. Um, but modern hypnotism, quote-unquote, r- really... Um, Maybe it doesn't begin with Franz Anton Mesmer, but certainly really took off with Mesmer. Uh, he was active during the latter half of the 18th century in Paris, although he was born in uh, Austria. He became an, uh, one of the biggest celebrities of the day. And in fact, there were far more tracks written about Mesmer than there were about Voltaire. Uh, and in this sense, uh, Mesmer was much more, more influential than, than Voltaire ever was. Uh, although he has become forgotten, um, probably because his practices in the light of our secular and rationalizing age look antiquated and magical. Is that where the term mesmerize came from? Yeah, that's right. Ah, yeah, it comes okay. from mesmer. Yeah. Yeah. So he, I mean, he's usually described as a hypnotist. You could say that he was a healer, but uh, he would have these healing sessions uh, or, or seances, meaning sittings, uh, which is where uh, where spiritualism got the term seance. Uh, and he would have these uh, sessions and he would throw people into sort of epileptic states or catalepsy and have them walking around, sleepwalking. Uh, if you see etchings from the time, they look absolutely anarchic. Mm. Uh, but you know, really throwing these people into all states of consciousness where they don't really know what they're doing, but they're doing all kinds of crazy things and then healing them of their whatever sicknesses might be possessing them. Now, how was he doing that? Was he leaving suggestions or was he forcing it out of their memory? So we don't exactly know what he was doing, but um, mm. I'm sure suggestions were a part of it. Uh, I would say that definitely talking, well, clearly uh, talking people into a trance state. Uh, I, know, I know that modern magnetism from uh, the mesmerist uh, school uses a lot of um, different techniques, as touching people in a different way or getting up very close to people and gazing in their eyes and this kind of thing and sort of uh, controlling people with these sorts of techniques. So he may have been doing that. Uh, he also had these different sort of baths, or I think they're called backhats, uh, which were sort of metal cylinders, if I remember, or metal baths with sort of handles, and different people would hold them to them at once because he was trying to hypnotize so many people at once. But he had this idea of this sort of fluid that, that, were, that surrounded people, 
and by sort of manipulating this fluid, you could throw people into a trance. So he was definitely doing something uh, with his hands as well, maybe something similar to kind of Reiki today. Um, just, just, just as an aside, I mean, I mentioned earlier this idea in, in uh, martial arts of chi or ki is similar to that. But um, in in the German occultism, uh, his his uh, his idea of this fluid surrounding people uh, actually re- sort of remained uh, within that within the German occult tradition. And so you find it uh, mentioned in uh, uh, Willy Schroeder's uh, A Rosicrucian Notebook, and uh, you even find it in uh, the Fraternitas Saturni, which is a sort of left hand path occult group quite dark imagery and aesthetics, um, but, the, the, but that also drew quite substantially from Freemasonry. It has 33 degrees, for example. You know, they will talk about magnetic passes, so that's straight out of uh, Mesmer's practice. Uh, and that's, you know, in, in the early 20th century, or, or the order is still going, but certainly during the early 20th century, this was still Something Mesmer was still influencing German occultism, but it's been forgotten pretty much in uh, in the English speaking world. But Imre, you, you asked me about the East and West, so uh, you know if you go back a century or a bit more than a century, you find that many of the the uh, founders of different occult traditions and different occult orders were practicing hypnotists. So uh, G. I. Gurdjieff was a practicing hypnotist. Papu or Gerard Ancus, who founded the modern Martinist order. Uh, he was a medical hypnotist uh, working in prestigious hospitals in Paris uh, and writing for prestigious medical journals about hypnotism, while, while at the same time writing books on magic and in those books writing about hypnotism. And uh, Saint Martin as well, uh, again, he, he practiced uh, the hypnotism of Franz Anton Mesmer. Uh, Martinism is often semi or loosely associated with Freemasonry. There is in England a hermetic order of Martinists that only only initiates Freemasons that are under a lodge under the United Grand Lodge of England or recognized jurisdictions, but most almost entirely from England, I believe. And there are many Freemasons who join Martinist orders. I'm I'm not a, a member of Martinism. It's a sort of Christian mysticism. But, uh, you know, their, their sort of uh, intellectual, spiritual founder, uh, again, was at least for a time a practicing hypnotist. So. Just uh, briefly, so, you know, if you went back 150 years and you were practicing uh, magic, then you were probably practicing hypnotism. And then this was really replaced by uh, Eastern meditation. So, uh, for example, uh, Kundalini uh, from the work of Arthur Avalon and then Alistair Crowley uh, promoted uh, Eastern meditation Um most obviously in his book, Magic in Theory and Practice, where he really presents it as the foundation of magic. Uh, it's interesting to note that in his book, The Sword of Songs, there is a poem called Pentecost. And in there, he says that uh, essentially he recognizes that all this quote unquote meditation stuff is just self hypnosis. Um, but I think, you know, honestly, I think. You know, there are some really good things about Eastern meditation, and I do do some Eastern meditation. But um, yeah, for me, hypnotism has been a far more powerful experience, and, I, and I've been meditating for over three decades. Getting back to the o- October issue of the Fraternal Review magazine, um, you had mentioned that you know key figures in esoteric philosophy, religion, uh, occultism, alchemy, all present in England around the same time period. And I'm just curious, like looking into this, this was right around the industrial revolution. So, or post industrial revolution at some points, how would Masonic brethren at that time, how how would they interact with truth seekers that were coming out of this age of really transforming the world? That's a good question. Yeah. So obviously there was a reaction against the industrial revolution, especially with figures such as William Blake, who wasn't actually a Freemason, but, uh, um, what was, was a part of a Swedenborgian group, um, uh, 
from Emanuel Swedenborg, the Christ, uh, Christian mystic from, in Sweden. And I mean, it might be worth mentioning that there was, uh, during the 19th century, a uh, Swedenborgian rite of Freemasonry uh, as well, which was founded in New York around the same time as the founding of the Swedenborgian church here. Freemasonry, in a sense, is very much, I don't know if it's a reaction against the Industrial Revolution, but it is, in many respects, contrary to it, right? So if you look at early Freemasonry, they are painting their own floor cloths, they are painting their own tracing boards, uh, the pr printing of, you know, aprons, manufacturing of things comes later on, um, you know, perhaps especially in America, actually. But, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution is all about mass production, in a sense. And Freemasonry was in its earliest days was much more grounded in doing it yourself. So, you know, for example, in in early rituals, Freemasons would themselves draw out, out quote unquote, the lodge in chalk or in chalk and charcoal on the floor of a higher tavern uh, room and might put objects inside of it as well. They're sort of laying out this this tracing board in objects and chalk. It's a kind of personal trans transmission from one brother to another you know things are hand painted or handmade themselves not a reaction against the industrial revolution it's it's very much contrary to it in spirit and it it, it may be seen as this spirit of trying to recapture the mystery and the mysterious and the sacred in the face of a uh, mass production, which means, you know, homogenization, right? So you, you produce the same thing over and over and over and over again. There's nothing personal to that. Yeah. And while you're talking about this, I'm thinking of, you know, the parallels of time. And we're talking about the Industrial Revolution. So like the 19th century, early 20th century. And here we are now. And what folks would consider the technology revolution, as we've talked about, you know, AI, machine learning, virtual reality. Yeah. And Back then, it was more of an individual study process for Freemasonry. I think it's kind of fair to say now Freemasonry is more of a group experience that we're trying to bring more of and connect with more of these truth seekers and these modern men who are trying to go back and learn the ancient mysteries. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was more of an individual experience then, but I think, you know, one good thing about Freemasonry today is that, you know, brothers are more interested in spirituality and the esoteric and mythology and archetypes and what might be, you know, archetypal to all humans, uh, uh, rediscovering the sacred. I think these are all good things, actually. We'll close it out with this question, uh, Brother Angel. I was really intrigued uh, in the uh, issue that's out this October for the Fraternal Review. The interview with uh, Brother John Mangiovi, the Master Mason and Magnetist, and he, he made the point that the ritual experience, which is kind of a combination of anticipation and excitement, those feelings, um, along with the certain, and I'd even think about this as, as you talked about the physical sensations, the energy that can connect some of us with the, uh, techniques and methods that are used in hypnotism for brothers who are listening, who may be preparing for an upcoming degree in their lodge, what recommendations do you have that could heighten these visions or this physical experience of attending a blue lodge degree? Recently, uh, I was listening to, uh, a discussion about Freemasonry online. And um, I believe the, the brother was a member of a Grand Lodge, uh, Grand Lodge officer. And he was talking about how, uh, you know, in the Scottish Rite, they're going to be introducing uh, virtual reality. And um, I personally think uh, that kind of thing is the way to kill Freemasonry. You know, it sounds good, but there's always this idea that what do the kids like? Let's let's do that, and then the kids will like us, and it never works. It always because because the kids already have that, and then they just see that you're copying them, and then they think you've got nothing to offer. You know, this was you know not to be t too controversial, but you know, in, I grew up in Great Britain, where where in England, where it has its own official church, the Church of England. You know, people don't take the Church of England seriously. I mean, sure, there are some people who do, but the vast majority 
have never haven't taken the Church of England seriously for for decades. And that's because, you know, they try to water it down, make it palatable to everybody, uh, strip away the message and the ritual and the mystery as much as possible, uh, you know, and make it whatever is on vogue this year. It just comes across as if it has nothing. You know, I, I don't need to go to a church to listen to someone playing a guitar uh, who, who doesn't even know if they believe in God. Seriously, Angel, thank you for coming on. Uh, best of luck with this October issue and continued success with your time at the Fraternal Review. Yeah, thank you. It's been great speaking with you again. And thank you for the shout out to the Fraternal Review. I hope brothers will subscribe. If you enjoy our podcast and you want to hear more, you can tell Siri or Alexa to play the Craftsman Online podcast. We are available on all streaming platforms with new episodes every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Thank you.